Hey everyone, welcome to the Cybercrime YouTube channel. In this video, I'm doing a follow-up to my January 23rd video about the SolarWinds hack. There's been a lot of good information that's been released about this, especially detail on how the attackers compromise networks and also on how to respond to this incident. So anyway, let's get started. So as a summary, SolarWinds is an Austin-based monitoring software developer that was breached. And specifically, their Orion software had malicious code injected in what's called a supply chain attack. So what's interesting about this attack is that the attackers weren't targeting their primary targets necessarily initially, but they used this software as a secondary tertiary jumping point. So basically, the attackers injected software into the SolarWinds Orion software, and then they knew their primary targets were going to be using the software. So... Some of the organizations affected were big players, FireEye, the Department of Defense's National Security Agency, the NSA, was uh, running the vulnerable versions of software. Microsoft was, was running vulnerable Orion software. And the estimate that I've seen is that over 18,000 organizations were running Orion software. Recent media reports show that about 50 to 200 organizations were particularly affected. And so I think what that means is that they were basically targeted for data collection and data exfiltration by the attackers. So one thing you should really look for right now is the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency CISA's guidance. This organization is a, a, gov a U.S. government organization that's put together a lot of good information about, about the attackers and how to clean up your networks. So Advanced Persistent Threat or APT actors gain access to networks and then move laterally to Microsoft Azure and O365 cloud systems. What's really interesting here is generally when I think about lateral movement, I think about lateral movement on an on-premise network and not necessarily to the cloud. So this is really interesting in my opinion that attackers have moved laterally to, to cloud networks and cloud systems. So once they're in the cloud, attackers then use privilege access to collect and exfiltrate data. And what's really nefarious and troublesome about this is the attackers created back doors to allow themselves to get back onto the networks after the organizations thought they'd cleaned up the, the hack. And this is a piece here where I really had to read two and three times over through this because I, I hadn't seen an attack like this before, but the attackers were able to bypass multi-factor authentication by compromising ADFS, that's Microsoft Active Directory Federation Services. The attackers stole the ADFS token signing certificates to forge authentication tokens, and this attack is referred to as a golden SAML attack. And this is really high-level stuff, in my opinion. Um, by all means, this is a clever attack, but there certainly had to be a bit more thinking behind this. The attackers then modified or added trusted domains in Azure Active Directory, and then once those domains were there, the attackers moved laterally to those environments by adding new federated identity providers. So I definitely encourage you to read through the CISA documentation about this because this is very technical and we'll get into detecting this here shortly. So I think one concept here to define that would be really helpful would be defining persistence. So persistence is a concept that indicates how attackers are able to remain in a given environment. So if you're an attacker and you want to breach somebody, the idea is that you don't want to give yourself, ideally, just one mechanism for getting back into that environment. You know an organization, once they find your breach, they're going to go in and try to remove, to close all the doors into your into the network. Well, if you can even have one in place there, maintain it, then afterwards you can come back into the environment. So the attackers were able to establish persistence via API-based access. It's application program interface access. The attackers then used the API-based access to gather and exfiltrate data. And then one thing they did to make it more difficult for them to be caught is they obfuscated command and control traffic. So I know one of the mechanisms I read about that they did this with or how they did this is by incorporating their traffic into legitimate traffic. So they mixed it in there so it became much more difficult to find their command and control traffic. CISA provides some really good information about how to detect Azure and O365 compromise. So there are three main tools they cite. So one is by CrowdStrike, which is a terrific security company. They have an Azure reporting tool 
Then the open source community created a utility called Hawk, and then CISA created a tool called Sparrow. And I read, I had to read through the documentation twice, and this stuff's really technical, but each one of these operates somewhat differently. So I would definitely go to these CISA articles and figure out how to work these, how to use these. And then each of these can give you some different indicators of compromise. So um, they all look really valuable. And I, yeah, again, I highly recommend you read up about these. So this next link, Advanced Persistent Threat Compromise of Government Agencies, Critical Infrastructure, and Private Sector Organizations. So in my previous video, I cited one domain specifically, that's avsvmcloud.com as a sign of compromise. So the attackers were using this domain to talk outbound with their command and control traffic or to exfiltrate data or both. But anyway, that's the primary domain. I think it's still the primary domain that CISA cites, but by no means is it the only domain or IP that's used by the attackers. So definitely read the second main bullet that says IOCs or indicators of compromise. Read through that, you'll see a list of domains and IP addresses listed. I would highly recommend you go through your environment, look for traffic to those domains and IPs to get an idea of if you might be compromised. And then if you want to comb through your Azure and O365 environments, I highly recommend that. This last CISA article, Detecting Post-Compromised Threat Activity in Microsoft Cloud Environments, talks about that. And again, in my last video, I talked about um, looking at your network for unusual traffic. So in this diagram, you see two normal sources of traffic to Microsoft.com and update at Microsoft.com. But if you're monitoring your network closely, you can find unusual traffic. So here in this diagram, you see that SolarWinds server talking to avsvmcloud.com, and this would be an indicator of compromise. So what are some immediate mitigations you can put in place here? So of course, Look and see if you're running a vulnerable version of SolarWinds or Orion, and you can tell if you're running a, a legit version or a vulnerable version by going to the SolarWinds website. Um, if you're running something vulnerable, I would highly recommend you nuke it and then uh, spin up a new server, run the non-compromised version of Orion. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, um, some immediate mit mitigations, look for traffic to the IOC, so the indicator of compromise IPs and domains. Certainly search for avsvmcloud.com, but then know that that's not by any means the only command and control traffic or the only data exfiltration point you should be looking for. And what are some good long-term mitigations? I highly recommend you establish a known good baseline for network traffic on your network. It's important to know what your systems should be talking to and what they shouldn't be. The more critical and the more sensitive data you have, the more critical your business is to you, I think this should rise up in priority. By, you know, by all means, is this slide a challenge? And so another two technical points I would say is implement default deny firewall rules for egress traffic. And that means anything that's going out on drop unless you specifically allow it. And then alert on non-standard egress traffic. So if you have systems talking outbound to IPs or domains that are unexpected, alert on that, and then go back and inspect it and look Check and see if your given server is talking to an IP or domain that needs to be allowed. If it's suspicious, of course, investigate it. But I think um, another challenge here is that oftentimes legitimate software, and I've, I'll use Microsoft as an example, you'll see traffic going outbound to new Microsoft subdomains or new Microsoft IPs that you didn't have to allow. And so this is certainly an ongoing challenge, but again, if you have a high level criticality within your business, uh, if you need high-level security, you need to go in and really deny by you know all means any kind of network traffic that's not that's not business critical. Further, I would segment your network, place systems of different importance in different segments or different subnets, and then implement default deny rules between those segments. The benefit of doing this is it prevents attackers from moving laterally so easy once they're on your network if they get that far. It certainly becomes a stumbling point for them. And then for you, it helps you to, again, know which traffic on your network is legitimate. Finally, um, I highly recommend you do your homework. And by this, I mean, read up on, the, on this attack. Um, you know, uh, even if you're not running a SolarWinds Orion vulnerable instance, I think it's important to go through and just double check yourself, double check your network to make sure that these IOCs aren't present and, um, the Center for Internet Security, CIS, which is a different organization from uh, CISA, has guidance. SolarWinds has guidance. And like I mentioned, 
the CISA organization has guidance as well in the two URLs I mentioned previously. If you found this video helpful, hit the like button, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.